I took forensic anthropology. Ooh. Yeah. Did you see dead bodies? And then you're like, why did this dead body live? Well, he was racially discriminated against, so that was already a yikes from the get-go. You remember that random time that I worked with dead bodies for like three days? Yeah, and you were like, oh, I was I, like, that I was a bad call. That. You know, it turns out the severed heads maybe were not the best Oh thing, my God, but... it was so scary. And yeah. so like, I've, like, I went into forensic anthropology when I was first starting at college because I was like, maybe I want to go into something relating to this. Yeah. So like I thought that maybe I wanted to go to like mortuary school or like something like that. And then, you know, I had the opportunity to actually like work with dead bodies and it's you were like, mm. not my cup of tea. Yeah. Which <laughs> fair. I remember you just telling me that you were going to be working and I was already like uncomfortable myself. <laughs> and I wasn't even I can't imagine being in the <laughs> actual <laughs> place. It's like just hearing it offhand like, I'm like, oh God. So that's that <laughs> oh. was a, that was a call. Yeah. Of sorts. That Literally was... lasted three days before I was like, and I'm done. I, I literally Fair went up enough. to them and I was like, I could give you a two week notice, but I've literally been here for like a total of 16 hours. And so <laughs> You're like, I don't think I'm going to be much extra. Right. Like you will quite literally have to train me more in order to keep me for two more weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, it's a rough time. Yeah. It's a little bit of a whoops. <laughs> Whoopsie doopsie. <laughs> Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and anyone watching who has another term to be called <laughs> because fuck the gender binary. <laughs> um, hello, uh, welcome back to the Cynical Cinephiles podcast where we are cynical, we watch cinema, and we're filey. So <laughs> my name's Caleb. I'm one of the two hosts, and the other of the two hosts, who is the second host of two, is... Caitlin. Hey, That's welcome back, name. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're here again after a little bit of a break. Kevin yeah. was a little sick. I was. It was a, uh, my voice actually sounded disgusting. I still feel like I have that little bit of a rattle in my voice. Yeah. And I feel like whenever I'm listening to a podcast and the host is like, oh, I'm sick, you know, like, don't mm -hmm. mind my voice. I never notice. But I mean, like, when I tell you I literally sounded like someone had taken my lungs and put them through like a juicer yeah. like it was not cute <laughs> that's fair see i feel i don't know maybe it's just because i know you i can definitely still hear it in your <laughs> voice, but I, maybe it's just because we're such well, it's good friends, so you know? much better now though that, like that's, you, i can imagine yeah yeah <laughs> you so said your bad. voice sounds like you've gotten over being sick <laughs> yeah. and you're still your voice is just like on its way to recovery right exactly it's a, it's a journey yeah an adventure of sorts. Speaking of adventures. The real <laughs> voice was the journey we made along the way. <laughs> Stay tuned to next episode for Caitlin to continue her journey of getting her voice back. Oh my god. Be a very emotional journey. In preparation I use like a humidifier. <laughs> It's 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 gonna be intense. The fucking like Taylor Swift like <laughs> regime <laughs> trying to prep my voice. It makes me feel so stupid that like my voice like gave out because I like got a little sick when she's literally do like doing the craziest tour right now. Yeah. With three hours of singing like every single fucking day. Yeah. And I mean, my voice was just like. Eh. <laughs> the difference is that she's like a you know like a like a billionaire. That's true. And she can like afford like steroids and stuff to that's like true force her voice to be good <laughs> ah. anyway um speaking of voices uh the character the titular character of the movie we're talking about today has a voice of all the segues <laughs> i tried to think about doing at some point that was, <laughs> that was the, worst the worst one, one. <laughs> i was like i tried journey then emotional journey those both would have been so much better but instead i <laughs> but jumped I just, off of voices because <laughs> i cut you off yeah i was yeah. like let's talk about me some more <laughs> <laughs> but he is a voice. It's a Marcel the Shell with shoes on. Marcel it's a movie. The shell we finally watched it. I know. I'm so excited. Time. We've been waiting. We've been 
yeah. Just brewing, <laughs> waiting, walking, talking. Uh, I don't remember if we've told this story on the podcast before, but I was thinking about this yesterday, and this will be more of a you story because it's you, but I remember you talked about the first time you had seen the Marcel the Shell trailer. You had a very different <laughs> perception of what it was. <laughs> I thought it was a horror movie. We definitely have talked I about this, but I think we should talk about it again because yeah. it's, I mean, it's what we're watching. Yeah. Um, but up until, you know, like at this point, the only like real introduction that I had to A24 at all was uh, Midsummer and Hereditary. <laughs> and also, I didn't know that A24 was a studio. I thought A24 was Ari Aster. And mm-hmm. so I knew that Ari Aster did horror movies as A24. I feel like that's not that crazy because like A, Ari, you know? Yeah, Um, yeah. But I like saw the trailer for Marcel the Shell and I was just like, when is, how are they going to make this into a scary horror movie? (laughs) You're waiting for Marcel to stab somebody. Yeah, literally. Or get like stepped on her or some shit. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely still an A24 movie. Oh, for sure. Like it's artsy. It's like the opening too. It's just Mm -hmm. this long. Also, I loved, and I had pointed this out as uh, as I was watching it. I was like, that's how you know it's an A24 movie because the aspect ratio is just slightly smaller than this one. There's the teeniest black bars for no reason. They didn't need, they could have just shot it normally there's zero reason but it's it's the arti- artistic value those teeny little b- black bars add a lot to the but look, uh you know? um you know marcel the shell with shoes on is not a horror movie and so if uh if he, i would be so kind <laughs> i am going to synopsize yes, it <laughs> if, you would be so kind. i would be you, i'm the, you, I know the you, kindest you would person alive <laughs> you, you would be that kind so kind very kind. um so, so about? essentially marcel the shell with shoes on is about it's a mockumentary um mm. about marcel and marcel belongs to this community of other shells but also like fallen food tampons just like uh, it's yeah. essentially like the Isle of Lost Toys, but in terms of just these, like, um, like omnipotent uh, items that form this, like, community. Um, But Marcel has been separated from his entire community except for his grandma. And so it's about this, like, junior filmmaker coming and staying at this Airbnb that Marcel is at and following his journey as he it's like a little bit found family it's a little bit like journey it's a little bit you know it's it's Mm -hmm. so many beautiful concepts uh rolled into like one almost slice of life which it, it feels so silly to find like such human concepts being mm-hmm. explained perfectly by a fucking shell <laughs> that's my synopsis. honestly it, it is incredible that i i've heard that that description on, on like their press tour a lot and in reviews a lot where it's just like i just actually watched a behind the scenes uh feature on the on the movie earlier today and in that the crew members were saying that it's just a very human story which is so interesting given that it's from the perspective of a shell yeah uh, with shoes on <laughs> he's so fucking cute Marcel. Too. he's so cute his like little voice is so cute yeah and he's like so capable of making you feel so many things mm-hmm. while still being like just so jenny slate is just an incredible actress oh my god yes. um she is the voice of marcel and um I've, I've been a big fan of hers for a long time um, but just the way that she is able to convey feeling while saying something else oh my God. while being a shell. Like yeah. it's, it's a whole different ballpark. Down. Yeah. She's got it. Uh, speaking of the voice though, we had, we had a viewer submitted request that we oh. both try to, to do the voice. Oh my God. I've not tried once and i am terrified to i haven't you I've you never, just sprung this yeah, on me <laughs> yeah i've been trying uh, yeah i have no idea how to do it you should go first because i don't trust wait him. can i, I listen to, the, to him talk yeah. real quick he's Mar- marcel the shell okay with shoes on with shoes on with shoes on let me see what's what's a classic marcel all okay. right hold on i'm gonna I'm gonna play just a little bit of his talking. 
Oh. Ouch. Whoa. Block it. Whoa. <laughs> Block it out. Caitlin trying to give free <laughs> yeah. advertising? Literally, no. Without being paid? Uh, no, I will not advertise anything unless you pay me. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Now let me drink my branded water bottle. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I was I was posing with my water <laughs> bottle. Haley Steinfeld's brand Core. You should drink this. Um, so, but we don't advertise anyone who's being. I pay us, please. Okay. I will never advertise I'm gonna, for I'm you. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the voice. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was running to the water bottle. <laughs> I was, uh, so I just don't under, really understand, um, why you're being so mean to me right now. Um, this isn't actually any lines from the movie. I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just kind of chitter chattering a little bit. Yeah. I, 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 I feel like that wasn't that bad. That wasn't terrible. <laughs> you also have points for being still, like, coming off of being sick. Whereas <laughs> I don't have that. So I'm, oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Just do it. Um, Mine. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, God. Like, uh, my name is Marcel. And I'm no. Michelle. <laughs> like, with shoes on. It's not Why Urkel. Why are you being so mean to me? I'm Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of good things in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. There... So the answer is that we both suck. I felt like mine was better. <laughs> be real with you. Let us know in the comments below whose impression was better. Or that we both suck and we're equally terrible. That's why <laughs> I would like that answer, please. If you can tell me in the comments section below, how are we both shitty? At the same <laughs> level of shittiness, equally, <laughs> equally shitty in our voice. I think that's what the people would want us to say. Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, this movie's good. Oh, <laughs> it's a good movie. It's it's a... She's coughing. It's a I'm solid sorry. flick. Oh my it's god, a, it's so good. <laughs> um, can I also just say, uh, and this was my immediate reaction after finishing the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched it with Toby. And I like looked over at him at, with tears in my eyes, like streaming down my face. And I said, honestly, fuck Caleb for making me watch this movie because I sobbed my eyes out. Toby had mentioned that he cried for the entire second half of the movie. Wow. There was like 40 minutes straight of just him crying. That's crazy. I wasn't quite that bad, but when I started crying, I fucking started crying damn see i cried but i wouldn't say i was like sobbing i like i got me with a couple little sprinkles i definitely at the end of the movie was like, oh yeah okay i'm feeling tears 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 did exit my my tear ducts but it was it was a very very emotional uh movie it was very wholesome mm -hmm. i love anything that's found family yes that shit is always just, when the, mm. when the camera pans out and shows that he did find his family right yeah. I literally looked over at Toby and I was like, I am going to kill myself. Like, <laughs> this is so Jesus. sweet. That's, it's, oh my God. It, it's, A24 is a studio. They're, they're, they're the variety. Yeah. The, they know how to hit the spots. No, it's, I really do think Jenny Slate's performance lends particularly well to a lot of these beats. As, I mean, as you were saying, the, the cadence is, as in which she delivers all of these lines is, is terrific. Mm -hmm. But I also think, Really, I don't know. Just God, I don't even know how to talk about this. Um, it's I will, just so Dean uh, as a character. Mm -hmm. I thought that his acting was also superb mm -hmm. because there was at no point that I didn't believe that he was in the room with the shell. Yeah, and that's crazy because I, I was I was watching the behind the scenes featurette earlier today, and it took them like six years to make this movie. And the first thing they did at the beginning of the six year process was record all of the dialogue for both Dean and Marcel, like from the get-go. And they actually originally made the full film with just an animatic. 
And then they ended up shooting all the live action bits to put over that audio that they had recorded like six years earlier. Oh, wow. That was nuts to me. Like that, And so the fact that that like that dialogue was recorded so many years separate from the mm -hmm. footage is just crazy because you cannot tell when watching. No. Like it, they did such a, and even the stop motion, like clearly the actual design of, of like Marcel and the other shells is like, obviously you can tell it's that like kind of stop motion feel, but then the camera moves along with it in a way that like, you, it you feels can, real. Yeah. Like you can, you can tell that it's for sure. Of course, a, you, like, you know, it's not real, but it, you can't really, you don't know the technical stuff going it, in. It is so beautiful that you're like willing to suspend your disbelief. Yes. Like you willingly will just accept what's happening on the screen, mm -hmm. which isn't always the case. At least for me, it's kind of hard for me sometimes to suspend my disbelief. Mm hmm. And there's just so many just lovely shots. I love the in the when they're in the car together, and it's like the sun is beating down. And he's moving. He like throws up in the car, but it's all in front of this window. Yeah. The lighting on the shell perfectly matches all of the lighting on the outside. Every time mm -hmm. they pass a tree, the shadow goes over him, and that's like the fucking amount of work put in to make that all work is. It blows my mind. It blows my One mind. One of the things that I think we talk about a lot is, um, or and especially recently with the, the past couple movies that we've covered, mm -hmm. is how much you can tell that there's love put into the production. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is another incredible example of just love and passion being put into a project and how much yeah. that pays off. Honestly, it's you you can very clearly tell they cared about this character and they wanted to tell this story. And you're not going to work on something for six years unless you're very passionate mm -hmm. about that. And I think that that is very beautiful. Uh, do you know the, the the story of like the origin of Marcel the Shell or much relating to that? So I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. um, but I know it started as like a web thing, right? Like it started mm -hmm. as like a, a series of YouTube shorts. Yeah, yeah. They made like three YouTube videos. It was like Mar Marcel the Shell 1, 2, and 3 basically. But it was created by Jenny Slate, right? Yeah, yeah Den Jenny Slate and then Dean whatever Dean's last name was. Sorry, Dean, last name. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, they had co-created it because they were, I, I think I was hearing them talk about it in the, the behind the scenes today, but it was like they were in a hotel room or something and then they just kind of went to a craft store, created a little Marcel the Shell and were just doing this bit just because Jenny Slate had randomly whipped out this voice and they thought it'd be funny. So they just made this little thing. And I actually watched uh, as well the, the original three videos just to kind of see for a contrast. And it's funny because a lot of the bits from like, the, especially the first video made it into the movie with like Marcel's introduction, almost word for word being like, oh yeah, I'm Marcel and I'm a shell. And then at the end he's like, oh, I've done this so many times. I don't know why I'm getting this so weird. Um, anyway, but that kind of like leads to like the movie, yeah, because it, it makes it like canon, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, sort of. I, mean, I will say there's like a couple offhand lines in the original YouTube shorts about like him still, I think, having a family, or gotcha. like I think he talks about like having a sister or something, and there's like a few different lines that don't quite fit in, however. The movie does also very much like they upload the videos yeah. in the movie and they blow up still. So it kind of like half adopts them as canon, sort of. Uh, but it is still, it's really cool to, to see that like growth of it just being like some fun thing. It was, they weren't even originally planning on uploading it on YouTube or anything because they made it just for like a friend. And then the, the, someone was like, oh, can you share that with me? And they're like, oh, sure. So they threw it up on YouTube and then it just happened to blow up. And then they made a couple more and the, those also blew up. And then they ended up working on this feature for like six years, which is just, it's crazy. It's such a cool story. And yeah. I, I, I love seeing the, those sorts of stories and people getting these opportunities to tell larger uh, narratives because of just these fun opportunities that come that come of just these random inspirations of just like some little bit or joke. They're it's doing. definitely it. It means more than just like a movie studio being like, "Hey, we need." to make money mm -hmm. like what can we come up with to make money and a24 uh, is the opposite of that kind of studio given that they will they're now actively greenlighting movies that will not make the money i wanted to talk i'm just going to talk about this now because i want to talk about it bo is afraid <laughs> bo is afraid has a 35 million dollar budget for a movie to, to break even you have to make two and a half to three times your budget so it needs to make like you know something like maybe 90 million dollars to break even it's not going to, not even, A24 has like 
Their highest grossing movie is Everything Everywhere All at Once, which made $120 million. Hereditary is like their second or third highest grossing, which made $80 million. Bo is Afraid is a three hour long nightmare comedy that is like one of the least marketable movies to get a general audience member to sit through in the world. It probably will make like $20 million. Like it's not gonna get even close to anywhere near enough. And the A24 knew that, but they greenlit that just because they're like, yeah, we'll let you. They will just give people money to just tell the stories that they wanna tell without giving a fuck if they're gonna make, like that is the dumbest business decision I've ever seen. And I absolutely adore that A24 is, is making these movies just for like giving opportunities to tell these grandiose stories with giant budgets or sometimes smaller budgets. I think Marcel had a smaller budget, but still, I just think that's so cool that it's a studio that isn't all focused on just what's gonna make numbers. It's not, it's the anti-illumination. I think, I do think, <laughs> I do think at some point we should cover Bo is Afraid just yeah. because you had mentioned that I will hate every single thing about it. <laughs> yeah, and I truly think Caitlin, well, every detail, every single element of that movie, I think Caitlin would vehemently just despise. And so I think we should cover it. I mean, I'm down. I think it's one of the, I want to watch it again. I've been saying that it, once I watch it, watch it again, my opinion will be sealed. But I think watching it again, I, it very likely could become one of my favorite movies I've ever seen. And I say that while having kind of been like bordering a panic attack for the first hour of it. Awesome. Which was the most miserable thing ever. But it, it, it's, well, you know, it, yeah. what's even funnier to me about that being your opinion Yeah, is I feel like it is in all the episodes that we've done, we very rarely truly disagree about a movie. Yeah. But in all actuality, our taste in movies is very different. And <laughs> I don't know if that means that you just are pretending to be agreeable on the podcast mm -hmm. or if I am just a follower and I will just do whatever someone says, which I don't feel like is true because I feel like I fight with you all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. If we're the, I feel like. I, I, I don't tend to dislike... I think we've had movies that we have vehemently disagreed with. Falling for Christmas is a, a big one where I fucking hated that movie more than anything. And you're like, it's pretty good. Uh, UHF, I had a, a big soft yeah. boss for, and you're like, mid-tier. Fucking mid-tier. It, it just didn't have that kind of nostalgic factor for me. Nostalgia, irrelevant. Peak cinema. <laughs> okay, word. But I think those are at least a couple examples of us having uh, pretty big disagreements. But I think we're also we have we have we're open minded. Yeah, for I the think most so. Part. I think we're we're not little bitches. We're we're not cynical. <laughs> I mean, come on. We're, <laughs> so we're not cynical. What a weird thing to label yourself yeah, as. Why would you call yourself <laughs> cynical. I wouldn't I don't like be positive. Don't give yourself a <laughs> negative label. Cause like, come on. Be open yourself up to positivity. I'm not gonna open a conversation. I'm cynical. <laughs> And I'm a cinephile. <laughs> so I did want to talk to you about a broader concept. Okay. If you'll allow me. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I kind of wanted to ask for your opinion and your feelings about using inanimate objects and like animals, mm -hmm. non-humanoids in order to portray these emotions. And if you feel like there is a correlation between these um, kind of emotions being more digestible when not being told through the lens of a human. Mm. I definitely think they can for sure be more digestible, especially for younger audiences. I think a lot of the times, I mean, a lot of children's movies in general definitely use animal and, and less human figures to tell these sorts of stories because I feel like it almost immediately lends this sense of, of curiosity and wonder to a lot of things because it's almost like if you're a child and you're watching a bunch of adult men and women and whoever making decisions, um, that's not going to relate to you as much as maybe like a curious George, a curious little monkey who is a monkey and doesn't understand this world that he's setting because that's going to be appeal more to you as a child. And sure, you could also follow movies with young children, but that's also generally just harder to accomplish, I think. Doing like a, a movie where you are filming actual children is, is just tricky a lot of the time. That does happen. But I also feel like as a child, you're going to be more wowed by something with an animal probably. But I also feel like a lot of 
these movies aren't necessarily marketed to children. Like Marcel the mm-hmm. Shell the Shoes on isn't marketed to children. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Marcel is like about bringing your little inner, it, it like brings you back a little bit, I feel. It's like a, about like healing your inner child a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's what I, I feel like it brings you back to your inner child. And I do think it was, well, it wasn't like marketed directly at children. It is like a PG film and it is like, it's made so that children can watch it. I, I, yeah. Even if it wasn't like directly marketed as a kid's movie. I just know that if I watched this as a child, I'd be bored out of my fucking really? mind. Really? Oh, think? yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. It's beige. The whole movie's in beige. There's no like obnoxious bright colors. That's there's true. No, That's true. There's no singing. There's no like things to stimulate my little ADHD brain. Mm-hmm. And so I think that uh, what I'm more curious about is, you know, you find a lot of adults who kind of lend themselves like, you know, if you want to talk about like Disney adults or like, yeah. um, you know, like Marcel or like... Um, people who find themselves um, like attract, not like attracted, but like Mm -hmm. they find aspects of themselves in characters that on one hand don't exist, but on the other hand, aren't even human Mm -hmm. and why we kind of feel like that is an easier way to digest our own emotions and feelings. I feel like it almost because it carries maybe an inherent sense of you have to suspend your disbelief to to follow it then maybe that it opens you up to being taken on a journey more or there's just more wonder if you're seeing the world through the eyes of something that isn't necessarily human in the same way that like people are more drawn to like fantasy stories because they don't take place on earth and it's like slightly different than usual maybe uh following a, an inanimate object or an animal or something is is also freeing in the sense that you're not just following a human and you're following uh, someone else who might have a different perspective than you but then as you're seeing them share similar struggles with you and you see you're a lot of yourself in this person then you're able to connect to them even more strongly and yeah then, Maybe. It's kind of like um, not it when it feels less like reality, it's less scary. Yeah, yeah, it definitely that you you're yeah, literally. I mean, I think if it's if it immediate if if you go into a movie that is just abrasive and like reality and just intense and reminds you of the things you dislike about reality, you're going to be a lot more closed off. Whereas if you go into a film and it's more of a comforting opening presence, you might open yourself up more, and then it can kind of connect with you and take you on more of a journey and I think that could be a lot of that but I do think um, with Disney adults and stuff like that I do think a lot of that relates to your inner child and kind mm-hmm. of just opening up it, the, this more innocent part of yourself and letting yourself go on these more uh, just I don't know just yeah. wholesome little, little can times. I talk about books for a second yes because I think it relates to <laughs> let's see if I can bring up books in every single podcast that's that's gonna be with me in the movie <laughs> Bo is afraid in every single podcast yeah, that's exactly. the only thing I can think about <laughs> um is so you know that like as of you know, last year I started reading a shit ton again and like yes. that's my like 90 percent of my personality right now <laughs> um one thing that like there's a author who got insanely popular in this kind of like book talk, like Mm. um, people who have been reintroduced to reading because of TikTok. Yeah, J.K. Um, Rowling. No. (laughs) Um, (laughs) There's an author that gained incredible popularity because of this this like TikTok, um, Mm. and it is Colleen Hoover. But now a lot of people are saying, for people who are interested in getting into reading, you absolutely should not start with Colleen Hoover. um, Because a lot of people use books as a form as escapism. And Colleen Hoover's books tend to be very abrasive Mm -hmm. with like slice of life very much like this could happen and there's also like a lot of you know being marketed as a romance but showing like domestic violence and major issues in their in her plot lines and stories that make it feel like if you don't know what you're getting into. And we've kind of talked about this where I think that the burden is not on the author, but the reader. And mm-hmm. that's kind of what we've talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But that if you are like, if you're going into this story expecting a love story and then you're being shown this like awful 
torturous, um, like horrible, toxic relationship that if you're like a younger reader, you could like see that and be like, oh, well, maybe, you know, it's like mm -hmm. kind of like a bad influence. And so I, yeah. I think that's interesting, especially because you were just talking about um, having that kind of like abrasive, like mm -hmm. slice of life in, uh, in uh, cinema. I will say, honestly, all of my favorite like series and pieces of fiction generally have heavy anti-escapism themes in them where that's like the core thesis is like not to use escapism as a way of like avoiding reality or like I, uh, my favorite series of all time is, is ReZero. And that whole thing is like kind of uh, deconstructing this genre of isekai, which in like anime or Japanese fiction is a lot of like, it'll usually be a, a male, a young male who gets tr transported to this fantasy world where he can then live out all of his dreams and live a better life and get everything he's ever wanted. And it's everything. And then the readers can all put themselves in this, just, just this beautiful thing. And they get to everything they've ever wanted and no one else has agency. It's just about everything you want. And then ReZero takes that and is like, okay, this guy goes to another universe. And then he finds out that it's still the same as, as the, the earth. Like you still have to be kind to other people. You're, if you meet some girl, she's not automatically going to be in love with you. You can't just like not listen to anything she says and just be like, well, I'm going to do this because you're supposed to be in love with me. Cause then she will just be like, you fucking suck. I'm leaving you. You are a horrible person. And it's, it inspires more growth because he has to realize that he still has to actually make the effort to be a good person. If he wants to be recognized in, in society and I love those types of, of stories. I kind of love that though. Yeah, that, like that, I, the in, I think that's a much better message and I think the escapism can, I think you can utilize it in a way where if you kind of lull someone in with some sort of escapism and then maybe explore deeper themes within that, you can do something interesting there but I, I very much just love literature that or fiction or, or cinema or anything that and goes completely against that. Evangelion is another one where uh, the primary character of that will constantly just like, just kind of huddle up in a ball and shut himself out from literally everyone and just try to escape into his own mind to escape like the consequences of his actions and escape the world oh, around me. him. Oh my God. <laughs> but I, I will I, say uh, that like escapism is like my favorite pastime. Um, <laughs> I love, you know, like I, I think that there's a lot of merit and a lot of, um, good valor in what you're saying yeah um but me personally <laughs> <laughs> like i love like a like a stardew valley where yeah you know if i talk to you enough times you're inevitably gonna fall in love with me because i'm the main character like i i mean that's fair and i i don't think i think but i i also feel like there's there are different levels of escapism as well though, right where i i, I think it's it's playing a game where you're as if it, it i think as long as you can kind of distinguish the lines of reality oh, i fucking and, hope so yeah <laughs> i'm like as, as long as it doesn't <laughs> become like a toxic level or like a coping mechanism to some degree where it's like you cannot function in reality if you don't have like this amount of escapism or like you physically can't be in reality then it's maybe you're gonna want to like try to reassess and like figure things out you maybe know? see a therapist you know therapy's good better help we is here <laughs> Hey, I don't think that's... Uh, no, I mean, uh, we... Um, worse help, or semi-okay help, mediocre help is here to help you in an okay way. It's cheaper. Uh, Fluoxetine. Per peroxetine. Citalopram. Moral of the story is don't don't escapism if you can. It, don't do it. It's but also good. it's okay to like have these characters like Marcel the Shell with shoes mm -hmm. on that can make it easier for you to digest the aspects of your own reality that otherwise may seem unpalatable. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's I think it's okay to connect to a character and follow them along and almost see through their eyes and perspective. I mean, that's what first person literature is all about. I think it's more of just not using that as a means of escaping your own life. But I think with like Marcel, for example, it's like it, it following Marcel can kind of illuminate like a story it can teach us to remember things about like family and home and how important that is and i think they mention in the movie um the like during the like 60 minutes interview where they're talking mm -hmm. about how marcel is able to highlight the things in our own life that we take advantage of and i think that mm -hmm. especially as kind of 
preachy as it sounds to be like count your blessings um i do think that it's very important um to like take a step back and be like um you know here are the struggles here's everything that i'm struggling with and i do this a lot in like my own personal life because you know i struggle very heavily with mental health issues mm -hmm. um mental illness isn't it bruv um but one thing that i find that is very <laughs> helpful for me yeah is i will like take a step back and look at all of the things that i'm struggling with mm -hmm. and like kind of oh my god this is gonna sound so fucking <laughs> it's gonna sound so like <laughs> christian <laughs> oh, but being like um like grateful for the struggle because mm. like you know for example um like i am struggling with money like i am short yeah. on money why am i short on money well because i have a roof over my head mm -hmm. because i have you know a car because i have pets that i take care of and those things are all blessings so even though yeah. like i am struggling with money I'm grateful to be struggling with money because it means I have things to spend money on. Like mm -hmm. I may struggle to keep my house clean, but like it is a struggle that I am grateful for because it means that I have a house to clean. And like, and yeah, I mean, and that's something that is, it, especially when I'm feeling greatly overwhelmed with life and everything. That's especially when I need to like take a step back and be like, okay, how can I, instead of being pissed at my situation, how can I be grateful for my situation instead? Yeah. Because for everything that I struggle with, there is, you know, 10 billion people who struggle 10 times more than me. Honestly, no. And I think Marcel does a really good job of just showing these small things that we take mm -hmm. for granted. And like, just, I mean, I think, and that's in life in general. Yeah. It's like, we can see actual other people uh, who do, struggle a lot more than we do who don't have the luxuries we do in our part of the world we also we have certain commodities or luxuries that we just don't even think about and while well, marcel the shell is a of course that kind of fictionalized little thing that, to to show these sorts of struggles in a different way that we would be comparing to like other humans uh it still does a great job of mm -hmm. just showing the the wonder and glory and just little things we have like I don't know, it is it's it is very beautiful. I think I think it is in, in very beautiful. It's it's always good to I think it, it's almost it's it's always good to just see size comparisons, whether it's like to see how small we are or to see how big we are in comparison. I think both sides of those of, of that size scale is really interesting because I think we all we often get very caught up in our own lives and we lose a lot of perspective um, of just the, what the whole big picture small picture any fucking picture looks like so seeing people smaller than us not people but like seeing something smaller than us who has to who, who's living in a smaller space who thinks that like the world is con like confined to just this one city there's that one scene in the movie where marcel is like wait what there's there's more and like yeah there's like millions of cities like this and then he's like all like shook that the world's so big versus on the other hand on the other side of things like stories told in space or like larger than the universe can also put into perspective how we're like a lot smaller than we often think and i think on both sides of that just getting that sense of scale and perspective is is really helpful and just letting us appreciate these these smaller moments of existence and being here and and also just, like seeing you know like how marcel <laughs> has been able to like adapt to being not having a community and like all the different like mechanisms and like through Goldberg machines to like mm -hmm. essentially get everything that he needs in order to survive. Like that's also like talking about things that we take for granted. Yeah. Yeah. No, honestly. And okay. Shifting briefly. I want to just say with the, cause you mentioned the good morning America thing a, a bit ago. The 60 minutes. Yeah. Sorry. 60 minutes. I definitely got that right. The first time did not mess up once. Yep. Uh, 60 minutes. I think it's really interesting because they also have a montage with a bunch of late night shows like Conan and a bunch of other people. And I, it's so funny because whenever a movie does this, I find it horribly cringe when they bring in like late night or, or morning shows or anything like that. And it just feels like weird and corporate. But this is like the one example of that where I feel like it worked really well for me. Like I didn't find 
it, like it would just it it would just didn't weird me out which was I think it's because it started as like a YouTube skit mm-hmm. where it's like it felt more believable that these could have been headlines that were actually made. Yeah, yeah. Rather than just like falsely manufacturing them. And I think I, I'm pretty sure that the clips that they used actually were real clips from from interviews on this. Like the Conan one, I think was <laughs> actually from an interview with Conan, and I think that definitely lends us to a lot to it. And then also, I think with the 60 Minutes interview, the fact that they establish early on in the movie that Marcel's grandma really loves uh, 60 Minutes and yeah. Leslie, what's her last name? No idea. Shawl. Stop. Stop. Don't ask me. I'm sorry for everyone who's <laughs> embarrassed of me right now. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the fact that they established that early on makes the payoff when 60 Minutes actually tries to get in contact and be like, ooh, we heard from one of the YouTube videos that you like uh, your fans and them reaching out and wanting to, like, I don't know, it just feels so much more naturally woven in comparatively to a lot of things where it just feels like cringe. It needs to take place in our universe, therefore, mm-hmm. we're going to throw in these random news. Yeah, or it things. just feels like they, they like I don't know, it just feels like they like throw in the thing where they're like, oh, hire James Corden for this bit where they go on James Corden, and then it's like, yeah, but like, you're just advertising James Corden. That's like the bit of this, is um, that you're advertising his late night show, whereas like, with this, I didn't feel like it was advertising 60 Minutes, like that didn't seem the intent. That was a, a, a medium used to kind of like carry the story through i do want to talk about the death of the grandma yes um what the fuck (laughs) what it was so fucking sad it was it was pretty sad i mean i kind of assumed it was gonna happen well of course they foreshadow it yeah Yeah, they foreshadow it like fucking crazy when they show her starting to get dementia yeah but like still nothing could have prepared me Mm. I, I did like that at least Marcel and, and the grandma got that one last conversation where the, the grandma was really just like, I don't know. I feel like she was almost like saying her goodbyes and yeah. knowing it. And I feel like that helped uh, brace the impact for it really well. And I thought that was just a very beautiful. Like, I really, really love the analogy um, that Marcel used a little bit later on where he talked about how he felt that like when you're at a party and everyone's being really loud and it kind of makes you feel at peace and so you feel like you can oh rest. Oh my god, yeah. That I felt that so hard yeah. too. That was so real. It's so true. It's so well, true. Well, not for me, but like that, I no, it's, really? no, like are you joking? Like if it, and if everyone's over at my house, then I'm like need to be awake with them but i mean yeah if it's at my house but just like at a party oh i guess I that's like true there's yeah. like a, a sense of solace and just like being away from it all and just yeah. like having that it's that fucking the, the michael in the bathroom thing you know from the not that be more chill is necessarily a good musical i know people have hot takes about that but uh it's you know michael in the bathroom by himself Okay, well, never mind. I think there's just solace in being away from the action, even if you're having a panic attack in a bathroom. I think just being outside of the party can be yeah. a certain atmosphere that is very interesting. Yeah. Caitlin did not know what I was talking no, about. No, not so even a little okay, bit. That's fine. It's it's whatever. I'm not. Um, but I thought that that was incredibly sweet, and I yeah. I love the grandma. Um, I loved her kind of their relationship and um how the grandma like very actively tried to to kind of take care of Marcel, but let Marcel take care of her until she felt like it was impeding Marcel's ability to move on and live his life. Yeah. No, honestly, I, I, it's just beautiful. It's It's just, it's just beautiful. It's It's beautiful. beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, uh, see, I feel like that the movie itself is ultimately, it is, it's very simple, which is, why it's like thinking back on it, it's it's almost difficult for me to find a lot of specific individual things to talk on. But I, I also think that the simplicity of it and of its message and of its story is something that is just another beautiful layer to it. Like I, I truly, I don't know. It's just, it's just like, yeah, it's just good. It's just good. A twenty four makes cinema straight up most of the time. We We're should. ignoring barely lethal. All right. I think it's about time for us to transition into quote of the movie. Yes. Quote of the movie. I only have one quote that I picked up because I was like, I don't, I just like this quote specifically. Okay. So I don't know how many quotes you have, but 
Uh, I had to Google them because I didn't actually take notes. Damn. Okay. Neither did I. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming a no notes Andy. What is happening to me? I've slowly just. Gotten, I know. Yeah. I'm so bad at it. <laughs> yeah. I used to be very good. Now I'm just like, mm, nah, no. Um, no. So my quote is just, it's a little bit of a, a bit, but it's a. Uh, Marcel's reading comments and someone ends their comment saying peace and love. Yes. And he's like, peace? Uh, yeah, obviously peace. What a weird thing to try to test to see if someone else is into. Like, of course I'm into peace. No, sorry, I'm a real war person. No war, actually. I sign all my personal letters, war. Let the battle begin, Marcel. Obsessed. <laughs> I just thought I'm actually like super down for that to be quoted. Yeah, the movie because I, I think it's was so funny. funny. No, I'm a real war person. <laughs> like, I feel like that shit was just too. Marcel's so funny. Yeah, he's genuinely funny. Oh my god. I, I, he has a quote hmm. where he says, "Sometimes if I don't have a way to itch my itch, the only thing I can do is just stand there. I just let it get to me. I just have to scream it out, and then it proceeds to show him screaming." Um, which I think is so funny. <laughs> oh God, there's there's so many. I love the bit when he's talking about like his his issues with the dog, but he's always wanted a dog, and then he's just like pulling the piece of a lint. Yeah, that, <laughs> named that Alan. A, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> oh my God, and that was another bit from the original YouTube video that they carried over, and that was just mm, so good. Um, I really like this quote, and it says, "The rule is that I want to be having a good life and stay alive, not just survive, but have a good life." Hell yeah, honestly. Bang, bang. Marcel, just, there's so many, there's, oh my God. It, it's just so funny. There's so many funny bits. It's just, uh, uh, I loved when the, what the, what is it? The meme that the grandma sees and it was like, what was it? Like oh, when the, the kush, kush hits yeah. different <laughs> or some shit like that. And she's like, what is the kush? Oh my God. That shit was funny as fuck. It's always what they say on days when you have been, uh, have a really keen sense of being lost or losing something that it often feels like the sun shines the brightest. Mm -hmm. And then the next day there is a really sunny day with a good breeze. And I just remember thinking if I was someone else, I would really enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. Uh, that one is that hit a little too close to home. Yeah. I, I cannot deny. There's a lot of lines in this yeah. movie that just like they do hit a little close to home. Yet again. And I, I, I don't I even watching the behind I got the scenes. Another one. Okay. Uh, you go I was going to just say, even watching the behind the scenes feature, I'm still unclear on how much of the dialogue was improvised by by Jenny Slate and Dean last name uh, <laughs> or how much of it was scripted. But it certainly does feel like. I don't know. It definitely, I got the vibe with a lot of it that, that Jenny Slate was improvising some of that. And I think her, her, I don't know, just sense of where to take it is, and it brings so much life to Marcel just in these, the, both the funny lines mm -hmm. and the sincere ones, because it is that like sense of humanity. And it's yeah. just, God, it hits, it, it hits, does it hit. fucking hits. Um, the other part that I think of, I, I think I find my mind wandering a bit just thinking, what would my family think? And really noticing that they're not here to share it with me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good shit. All good right. shit. Those are, those are the quotes, though? Yep. I think oh, yeah. we should go with good the war one. Yeah, yeah. War and peace. I'm not going to read the whole thing out again because it's kind of long, but uh, we'll roll it now. So uh, rolling it in three, two. Just kidding. We're rolling it now. Peace. Uh, yeah, obviously peace. Like, what a weird thing to try to test to see if someone else is into. Like, of course I'm into peace. No, sorry, I'm a real war person. No, war, actually. I sign all my personal letters, war. Let the battle begin, Marcel. We roll it then, before we said one, that was cut caught you by i mean one would have actually like rolled as i was saying that last sentence so really it did go on one but anyway um scores that's a thing <laughs> scores scores um i'm gonna give it personally a nine out of ten i'm gonna give it an 8.75 out of ten fair enough fair enough that's gonna be needing me to calculate uh, <laughs> i'm so sorry Damn. i was thinking 8.5 and then i was like no, I feel like I've, I feel like it would be more akin to the nines I've given. So I was I, I went to nine. Uh, let me see, eight point seven five. Okay, so rounding up, it'll our, our the cynical cinephiles final score is eight point eight eight. 
So Sweet. that that is our final score for Marcel the, the Shell with shoes, shoes on. Um, and now that we've done the final score segment, a segment is supposed to follow that because uh, we do a thing where segments lead into other segments, and that's how you know we're almost at the end of the episode. Thank goodness. Uh, that segment <laughs> is Caitlin picking her movie because it was my pick this week, meaning it's her pick next week, two weeks from now technically. Next episode. What is your pick, Caitlin? <laughs> Okay, we're getting a little bit of a throwback. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you're also going to get, you're going to think this pick is completely out of left field. <laughs> but do you know what I've had an inkling to watch recently? What? Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> okay. Sure. So that's what we're going to be watching. Watching Pirates of the, the Caribbean. Yep. Another Kira Knightley movie. All right. I mean, I'm here for it. I do love me some some. Uh, no, in all actuality, I uh, went up to Toby and I was like, I have no idea what we should fucking watch, and um and like of course I have like a list of requests that people have like requested, um and then I just don't listen. And Toby was like, you know what? I think you guys should do pirates. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah, let's do fucking pirates. Okay, I mean sure. I'm I'm down for pirates. Sweet. Back when Disney made good movies. I'm so excited. I haven't watched uh, that movie. And then Toby was like, I didn't know you actually really liked Pirates of the Caribbean. And I was like, who fucking does Yeah. No, I'm a real Pirates of the Caribbean hater. Like, I love pirates. What a hot take. Yeah. Like that's that's <laughs> not I, that threw me off. You, you think Pirates of the Caribbean is an enjoyable film? Fuck you, bro. <laughs> That's that's crazy. <laughs> that is. I, I prefer the narrative of the theme park ride, actually. Shut the fuck I think up. it's a little deeper and there's more <laughs> introspection. The adaptation did not sell it for me. Um, yeah, I'm down for that. Hell yeah. Sweet. I've already figured out what my next pick is going to be, and I'm very excited when I get to, to say that because it's going to be so stupid. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited. Yes. All right, but we're watching Pirates of the Caribbean next week. Uh, next episode. Next episode. Anyway, that's an episode. Guys, um, is. You, I'm not, I'm I, not. I thought you were like no we're not like holding hands right now <laughs> I, was, you, I hit half five and then you turned your hand because i was pointing at them okay podcast out that was the <laughs> Just... weirdest fucking yes yeah, so we're on spotify and all those things if you want to listen to us and not look at us because we're ugly sometimes um speak for your motherfucking self i am speaking for myself <laughs> largely i thought maybe you'd want to be included no but, i fine. always is, look like a piece of cake <laughs> i don't i usually look ugly as fuck. shut the fuck up um but yeah that's that is an option if you want to do that otherwise uh watch us on youtube and uh like and do the things wherever you find your podcast Subscribe. follow us on social media maybe i'll post if i in there i did won't well, i never do I, never do. I, I, I don't know how i expect this podcast to grow because i just don't advertise it on social media oopsie oops oopsie got a poopsie <laughs> uh we're gonna see you next time um take care of yourself don't get sick be a shell and wear some love, shoes peace and not war and Garfield. Bye. Lasagna.